All right, guys. Well, here we are. Um, it is the last day of the month. This is going to be for the $20 tier. First and foremost, thank you, everybody that has supported me on the $20 tier, on the $100 tier. You guys support my family. I talked to Danny. I'm going out to Wisconsin on February 21st. So I got that lined up. Finally going to go visit the sponsors like I was supposed to. I lag on everything that I do. I don't mean to. It's not a good quality. I'm fucking disorganized, and it sucks. So anyway, um, it's been a long time since I've done this video. I, I went to look back because I was like, all right, where am I on the Naked Girl? Because people have been asking me for it for a long time. And I looked back on my list of videos and I couldn't even find the last one. I was like, oh my God. The series like passed away. It was just like a tombstone. There's like memories of a series that once was the Naked Girl. And, and basically what this series used to be <laughs> was what really happened because if you guys remember the whole thing was I was on parole I was on AB 109 which is basically probation parole hybrid um for the pimping and pandering case I'm a pimp I'd like go to anytime I'd meet with my parole officer they like hooked me up with like the pimp PO like the guy that was in charge of all the pimps and he's like I'm gonna anti-pimp it I be did do be on you know the anti pimp. I'm like, why do you talk like that? He's like, I don't. My name's Barry. How you doing? <laughs> it was pretty. He was, he was kind of an asshole, but whatever. He always mispronounced my name, and then of course you know they raided my house. But the whole thing is, when I was on federal probation, my YouTube kind of blew up. It's not huge. It's like sixteen thousand five hundred, but actually that's a lot of people. There's a lot of people that I think would kill to have that kind of following. I, I I know I'm grateful for it. It changed my life for sure. And then Patreon, that was just icing on the cake. And I definitely prefer the platform. Not even because I make more. I like Patreon because it's a smaller, better group of people. And I feel like the bad seeds have kind of weeded themselves out. So here we are. Um, the reason that I wanted to do a series in the first place called What Really Happened? Well, to be honest with you... It was because I basically had done my life story up until that point. You know, now that, I, you know, like I'd done my third prison term, I was like, fuck, I'm out of stories, which isn't true. I just had to think of like, like Boston, for example, Albuquerque. There's a ton of shit that I kind of just glossed over that I could go more into detail for. Um, and uh, this next month coming up, I think I'm going to be doing the return of Shaky Jake. More prison stories. Like prison stories we haven't heard before. Shit like that. Go like in depth into that shit again. That's what I think I'm going to do. Might do... Um, I don't know. I haven't decided. It doesn't matter. But anyway. The purpose of this series to begin with was to be able to say what really had happened in the year that YouTube had started without having to worry about getting violated, you know, because I could be like, yeah, I was at a bar the other night drinking, just drinking. And that's all I say. And then I like go into parole and they like slam me against the table. They're like, what the fuck were you doing at a bar? Look at your judgment and commitment. You can't drink. You can't drink, pimp. Come on. Come on. What are you, brave? You're not brave. You're a coward. You're a coward for pimping bitches. On the regular, I'm just fucking with you. Oh, God. You're an asshole, Billy. You know, or whatever his name was. But anyway, um, all right. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going into this shit cold, so let me, like, you know. Um, so where we had pretty much, uh, very short recap, there was a point in, like, the fall. I would quit my job, got on our profit, everything kind of just blew up. Started making money, didn't have to work for anybody anymore. Life was good. I relapsed on heroin, got off for a little bit. Nick Stahl helped me get get off, you know. Nick Stahl got me. Hey, get me off, Nick. Uh, I don't usually do stuff like this. I'm like, come on, man, you're famous. I'm just trying to tell people about it afterwards. So. Okay. Just this once. And then he got me off. No, that's some weird-ass thing to joke about. No, he let me come to his apartment, and he let me kick on his floor with his roommate. 
Shortly thereafter, I relapsed again. That was probably, it was right around Halloween time. I, mean, I was like buzzed light year. I, I had this outfit of Buzz Lightyear and I was wearing Dodger gloves. I was like, a oh, Buzz Lightyear. It was supposed to be a joke, but like I had like dried blood on my arms because I was shooting heroin. It was horrible. You know, it's horrible to live that. I always, one of the things with being a drug addict is I always really liked the double life aspect of it. I know that sounds bad, but that was one of my favorite parts about being a heroin addict. It's like almost like being a secret agent, except you don't fuck dimes, you know, you're fucking... women that look like they were constructed out of like, you know, mountain rocks or like, you're not drinking martinis, you're smoking crack. But besides that, it's like being a secret agent. But what I like about it is that double life. You know, I always like the aspect of the danger. It's right. You know, it's like adventure. You know, it's, you go to a ghetto, you don't know what can happen. You can die. You're like, this is, this is fucking awesome. I could die today. You know, and you like, I like, really like that. But on top of that, I also like, kind of like, you know, pretending like I'm doing good to my family. I know this is all sounds like sicko shit. Uh, you know, I put on women's panties. <sighs> Do karaoke in front of the mirror. I love having secrets. You know, it was nothing like that. But I I liked, like, all right, honey, yeah, I just got to go to the bathroom. And then I'm, like, get into junky mode, like, lock the door, take out my kit, cook up a shot really quick on the spoon. What are you doing in there? Nothing, I'm just shitting. Cooking it up real quick, making the shot, looking for a vein, getting frustrated because I can't find a vein. And then the reason I like it, because besides all the ritual shit, is finally finding that vein. And it's just triumphant. It's like, yeah. It's like a sense of accomplishment. I know that sounds really lame, but it's something you get addicted to because that's what happens with the addict mind. And they say it all the time. You get addicted to the ritual of it. If you snort cocaine, you get addicted to breaking it up in powder with your debit card, making up lines and snorting it with the tutor. If you're addicted to heroin, you get addicted to the ritual of making up the shot and injecting it. You know, if you're addicted to crystal meth, you get addicted to wearing shoulder pads and a football helmet and getting butt fucked by your homeboys. You're like, are you sure this is a game? Right on, man. You know, and you're in the three point stance, just wiggling your ass to your homeboys. And you guys come down and you're like, let's not tell anybody about this. But you get addicted to the double life thing, right? So, in the beginning, it was like that. You know, when I was, like, going out to the Halloween party or whatever. Halloween party. When I went out trick-or-treating with my kid. You know, it was like, I look back on that because that's how the addict mind is. I, it tricks me. I look back at that and I'm like, that was, that was bomber than bomb. That was the bombest, <laughs> pretty much. So that's how your chunky mind, you know, it likes to remember stuff. And then Paul died in the middle of all that. And it was a really confusing time because for the first time in my life, I had attention from people. And it was something that I kind of been seeking my whole life. I was like, yeah, I want to be famous. Hell yeah. But then once you start getting it and, you know, you're so many people want stuff out of you. And I'm not even saying I got fame. I'm just saying like, I went from nobody know who, who I was to like, you know, tens of thousands of people and things changed for me. It did. I met a lot of really good people. A lot of people that I talked to, sponsors, text, talk on the phone with, I, I actually consider friends at this point. You know, a lot of my supporters I consider friends. So there's a lot of blessings, but there's also a lot of pressure with it. On top of all that, Paul died. And with Paul dying, there was a lot of... You know, the thing with me and him is that we both kind of wanted that together. It's not even fame that we were after. It was, I guess, a sense of creative accomplishment. Because for guys like us, both of us have been told we were worthless our whole lives. We were both pretty creative when we were kids. And that's the one thing that people kind of gave us attention for. Him, way before me. He made that, that underground video, Kill Horse, and he got a lot of creative validation for it. People thought that was really cool. I thought that was really cool. You know, then later in life, I wrote my book. 
I got a lot of creative validation for that. But all of that time, we always shared this dream that we were going to make it together. And it got to a point with Paul, and it sucks, you know, thinking about this, but the last five years of his life, when he started getting brain damage from dust off, when he be, was completely incapacitated by alcohol and by the other drugs that he was doing, it started to look like he didn't have a chance to make it. Shit, it started to look like I wasn't going to make it either. But his neurochemistry started changing to the point where he just wasn't the same Paul anymore. He kept painting and he kept doing creative stuff. And I don't think I was as supportive of that as I should have been. You know, and I have to live with that forever. I remember he, at the end, he was writing a book and it was called Your Fate, Your, Your, uh, Your Friendly Neighborhood Sketchball. Now that was a term that I'd coined that he just thought was hilarious. It was a play on Spider-Man's Your Friendly Neighborhood Spy, Spider-Man or what? what is it? I don't know. But I used to say your, your friendly neighborhood sketchball and that had really stuck out to him. And that's this book that he was writing and it was really good. And of course, when you write something and you give it to one of your friends, you know, um, I think that I'm looking right. I just found a letter that he wrote me the other day and then I like cut it. I don't know. I like ripped it by accident. I'm pissed off about that. I don't know where. Oh, there we go. I just found this. this is a letter from Paul. I'm going to read it really quick. It made me sad. I'm going to put this up. I, I have no idea the context, but I believe that I had sent him wasting talent while I was in prison. Speaking of comedic parts, I almost forgot to mention the part about psychosis. Not just dead on, but funny as hell, yet at the same time impressive, immersive on a character level because I actually cared who was knocking on the door and what was going to happen to Damien. So he's talking about my book, Wasting Talent. And really the writing is a whole, as a whole is immersive. And it's an interesting good read. I'm into it. If anything happened during the non-viewing interval, license plate beginning with five, this is important I decide. Hey, remember that one night I kept shooting coke in me and Chelsea's room in your Santa Barbara house? Got extra paranoid and I ran out of the house into the streets? One of many similar memories, I know, but right now I'm... I don't know, reminiscing? He said spelled that wrong. About that particular night, because it's funny now. Funny that I ended up in a tree in the fire station pissing my pants. Some of my other word blurps that stood out to me, junkie mind tricks, Windows 95 pixel. I have no idea where that came from. I just found that randomly the other day, but that was a letter that he had written me and I just saw it sitting there. So I decided to share it with you. When he started writing his book, he expected those kind of notes back. Now, at that point, I'd already published a book. I'd already found some success. I'm not anything to brag about by any means, but more so than somebody that hadn't published something. So he kind of looked at my opinion. He took my opinion seriously and I gave him, I, I, I didn't give him bad notes, but I gave him constructive criticism. I was like, yeah, I think you should work on this, 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 and that. And he got really hurt about it. Like it really hurt his feelings. Looking back on it, I probably should have not been that harsh with him. I probably should have been more supportive. Um, and because he, his, he, the brain damage that he had at that point, I should have just been supportive of anything he was doing. I shouldn't have been like analyzing it like, it, you know, like he was a professional writer already. I should have been more gentle, pushed him along with what he was trying to do. The reason that I went into this whole rant about that is I'm trying to give you an idea of like what I was feeling during this time. When he passed away, this is the kind of things that you get flooded with. Now, the fact of the matter is, is I was on heroin when he died. So I wasn't able to deal with it like a well-adjusted, emotionally sound person. I was dealing with it like somebody that was on heroin. Like Paul died, I'm like, that sucks. Did you pay the Netflix? You know, but like deep down, somewhere in all of that flippancy, I was fucking sad. So when I finally started trying to get off heroin, 
towards the end, and now we're getting back to where I believe we left off last time. It was really hard for me to come back up for air because every time I would like attempt to get, I'd be sober for like an hour, and all I could think about was that Paul died. Paul died. You weren't supportive. You know, you were, you should have supported his art more. You know, you guys shared the same dreams. And then I came up a little bit more than him, not much more. If you guys remember, before he died, I did like a whole video tribute series of him where he like got burned on, you know, got lit on fire. And he loved that. You know, he was so appreciative that I did that. He was always like, oh, that's really cool. You know, that it's like, I know I'm not as sharp as I used to be. He was self-aware. He knew that his brain had changed. And it was really sad because he knew that he wasn't as, as as sharp as he once was. You know, that was just the truth of it. He was not the same Paul when he died. He'd been suffering for a long time and he just wasn't the same guy. When he had written that letter, he was like a couple years sober. That was the Paul that I loved. That's the Paul I missed the most, that period of him. Um, so it was really a struggle to get sober. You know, I'd never really lost anybody that I was that close with. I mean, I was really, really close with them. I guess Jenny, but Jenny cheated on me. You know, there was animosity towards her. You know, so after she died, I was like, so? She cheated on me. She deserved death. And it took me a long time to realize that that's just a shitty way to look at it. You know, don't look at the fact that she did, did something wrong to me. Let me celebrate a relatively fucking wonderful person that had some character flaws you know if everybody was going to judge me on like mistakes that I made nobody would like me not even the Dodgers foam fucking hand that I had sex with he'd be like nope nope he only wanted to fuck when he was high on acid he wasn't a real fan I like people like Larry Larry don't care Larry don't need drugs to fuck the hand. <laughs> what the fuck am I talking about? All right, so let's fast forward. Sorry, I had to like get going or else I wasn't going to be able to do the story. All right, so <laughs> that's when I got to cut the fucking introduction. So I, you know, towards the end there, YouTube's going. I don't think Patreon had started yet. I don't think so. I want to say that I'd started Patreon in like February or something. This part of the story is probably December, you know, because I had overdosed on Christmas. Christmas. I'd done a live doing goofballs. I was high on meth. I was high on heroin. And I overdosed because I did too much. I did so much meth that I didn't realize that I was doing as much heroin as I was. And then eventually I fucking went out, you know, Karina called 911. I had to go to the hospital. They Narcan me. That was well, I had my YouTube channel guys. Like that wasn't that long ago. And after I'd OD'd, I ended up going to score from Conrad. So if you guys forget who that was, I had this drug dealer named Conrad. Conrad was one of my friends that had inherited a shitload of money. Uh, you guys remember this story? He went out one night. He was probably, I don't know, 15 years older than me. I'm 35. No, he's not that old. Jesus. That would make him like 50. God, am I that close to 50? Holy fuck. He's probably like 43, right? Straight up sex offender looking guy. I'm not going to paint it any different way. The guy looks like a sex offender. What does a sex offender look like? He has like a black turtleneck and like fucking goggles and shit. No, but he looks like, he looks like a peeping Tom. I don't know what you think a peeping Tom looks like, but that's what this guy looked like. He's a creep. Hey man. Hope we get some pussy tonight. <laughs> what are you thinking? I'm like, yeah, that'd be cool. <sighs> if we don't, I got some panties I bought online. We can come back here, sit on the sofa. You get one side, I'll get the other. We can jerk off, we can smell them, I don't care. I'm just trying to come tonight, bro. That kind of shit, I swear to God. He was a weirdo. 
And if you guys remember correctly, what had happened to him is he went out to a bar years before I met him. He ended up going home with some girl. I didn't know this girl. He fucked her. No condom on. Took his goggles off. He's like, hey, look, I don't, I don't wear these when I fuck. Got her pregnant. One night stand got her pregnant. She ends up hitting him up. She's like, I have your baby in me. We're going to have it and we're going to be happy. Now, I never saw this girl, but if this pervert was saying that this chick was busted, she must have been busted. Because he wouldn't even show me a picture. He's like, no, no. I keep it in that dresser. It had like a combination lock on it. I'm like, why is there a combination lock? He's like, that's where her one picture is. Like, there's nothing else in the drawer. He's like, nothing, just her picture. And I keep it locked because I don't want people to make fun of me like you. Like, God damn, man. But what happened is this girl was a meth addict. Now, my friend wasn't a meth addict. He was a crackhead. Straight up crackhead. And he wasn't a crackhead when he met her. He became a crackhead later. Now, this is the thing that he didn't know at the time. So he ends up having this baby with her. He doesn't date her. Because he's like, dude, he's like, I couldn't even. He's like, I couldn't even be in public with her, man. He's like, she's fucking stunk. She smelled like belly button lint, dude. I'm like, ugh. He's like, but. Big belly button lint, not not small. Like, oh. This is the thing, though. Her parents were, like, big-time wealthy. Like, $50 million estate-type shit. They died. Right? And this guy, Conrad, is, like, the most... He's, like, the best actor I've ever met in my life. Everybody loves him, except for girls, because he's creepy. He's bad. I mean, I've been out to bars with him and he'll just say crazy shit to girls, you know? I'd be like, look, I've got a $65 Nordstrom's gift card I'll give you for oral sex tonight at my place. I've seen girls flick drinks in this guy's face. Like, he's hardcore. Try to fuck Karina when we first started dating. I had to check his that. We almost got in a fucking fist fight over it. She's like, I would never do that. But I don't know. When she's drunk, she's like, Phew. she's not the same Karina. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Whore! No, I love you, baby. Uh, no, I don't mean that. I was just joking. Well, I'm not joking about when she has alcohol. When she has alcohol, she turns into a whore. But I was joking about calling her a whore when she's not drinking. So her, this meth addict's parents loved this guy. They fucking loved him. They end up dying. And instead of giving their tweaker daughter money, they give him like 50 million or some crazy. I don't know what it was. I don't think it was 50 million, but he gets tens of millions. He was my buddy. And around the time he starts smoking crack. Now this guy, this is the same guy that bought out the strip club for my birthday. This guy's baller. I, I was in, when I'd be in prison, I'd call him and I'd be like, hey man. He can send me 50 bucks. He fucking blessed me with like, you know, 15 hundo shit. I was like, God damn, this, he's just a baller. But he was one of those guys, in case you guys forget. He had this girlfriend that I went to high school with. Forget, I forget what I called her. Let's call her Danny. Girl, Danny. Danielle. He had this girlfriend, Danielle. Now, I knew her in high school. She was kind of like a preppy girl. And... He told me when I met, like, when I was hanging out with him, he was telling me he dated her. I didn't realize that. I went to high school with her. I was like, what? Really? She's my age. You know, he's like, probably like eight years younger than him. He had gotten her strung out on Oxycontin and then eventually heroin, basically so he could control this girl. Her parents found out, took her away from him. She ended up going to rehab. She met a way less sketchy guy. Hot tan. Palabra. You know, shit like that. And uh, and he never saw her again. You know, and he was creepy as fuck. He's like, dude, I'll cash up you 40 bucks right now if you can check her IG feed. 
I'm like, dude, all right, shoot it, <laughs> you know, and I'd like look him up, I'd look her up, but he was, a, he was stalking her for sure, so when I started getting heroin, when I, because I lived in LA, and I'd go up to Santa Barbara to visit, I started getting it from him, and he was a heroin dealer, now he was dating her again, and he basically had her strung out like a fucking zombie at his place. Now, one time I'd gone over there, and there was a topless black chick there. He, this girl, Danny, was, like, in the same condition. She's wearing a t-shirt, running around in a thong. It made me uncomfortable. This is a girl that I was good friends with. I didn't know her like that. I'm looking at her white ass. I was like, damn. I'm just trying to get well. You know, I'm, like, asexual at that point because I'm all strung out. But it struck me as weird, right? The first time I saw it, it struck me as weird. So, the night that I overdosed... I had gone um, back to, right after they narcan me, I had a score because I was dope sick immediately. When they give you Narcan like that, you, you got to get more dope. Your opiate receptors have been washed out. You're instantly just plunged into fucking, I will suck it. anybody in this room's dick right now for drugs. Any sort of opiate. Oh, I don't give a fuck. Like, it's like that kind of stuff, right? And so I called him right afterwards. Green was like, what are you doing? I was like, I need dough. She's like, oh my God, you're a piece of shit. I was like, you don't understand. And so we head over to his place because he's not picking up. There were cops there. Putting like yellow tape up to his house. I don't remember if that's where we had left off last time or not. Um, cause I couldn't find the last video, but I went to go score from him and they were putting up police tape. Now that stuff is generally reserved for a murder scene, um, sex crime sometimes, but it has to be something serious, you know? Um, it's, it's not some pit like, oh, you have unpaid parking tickets, bro. You got a warrant. We got to put up yellow caution tape here. You know, it's nothing like that. You did something bad. I mean, it can range, you know, you could butt fuck a animal all the way to murdering a person, yellow tape. I don't know if butt fucking an animal counts under the tape, the illustrious tape umbrella, but you know, you know what I'm trying to say. So I didn't know what had happened. Phone's going straight to voicemail, whatever. All right. So we left. I don't remember what I did that night. I had to have gotten some, I think I literally went on Facebook and was like, just found anybody that I could. That was it. And I know all the junkies in Santa Barbara. Pretty sure that I scored from somebody else. I think I went on Facebook and just said it in like code, like anyone know where I can get any Negro and like quotation marks. I put like the little emojis of like the syringes. Karina's like, Oh my God. My parents go on there. I'm like, they're not going to know what Negro means. They're like, dude, they're Mexican. You're like pretty much telling them in English. If that was their English. I'm like, oh, you know, anyway. So we end up going back to LA and I'm really struggling at this point. I hit this plateau, you know, and I think around that time, is not a plateau as in like things got stabilized a plateau as in I was just stuck in a certain place wasn't getting any better wasn't getting any worse I was just stuck with a monkey on my back strung out on heroin right I remember a couple times doing lives whacked out on meth or heroin I was like yeah Ah, uh, I love all of you. I was like doing weird, like twitchy shit with my, there's like contortions on my neck and people were like, hey man, I think you're on dope again, bro. You know, I, uh, my sister does dope and I'm pretty sure that you're exhibiting the same signs as her. I'm like, shut up. Stop harassing me, fuck you. I'd like do videos about how people were harassing me even though I was strung out. It was horrible. You could tell I was trying. What have I always said? The rule of thumb. If I have acne on my forehead, I'm on drugs. Period. 
If I get a zit here and there, that doesn't mean that. But like, if I'm like, if I'm broken out and you see like any sort of scabbing on my forehead, all bad, all bad. So people were starting to find out, right? Paula died at this point. I think I finally finished Drug Stories for Truckers. No, I was just finishing it. And my friend, Riggy Mars, he started trying to get me into treatment. This is where I may have left off last time, actually. I don't even remember. But Riggy Mars has been a hip-hop artist in the underground hip-hop scene in L.A. for a long, long time. And I know he doesn't look it. He looks like some mild-mannered white kid, you know, that maybe does fencing lessons on the weekend. Dude, you know, he's like one of those kind of guys. But no, that guy's a cult gangster. I swear to God he is. We've been in some crazy situations. He told, remember he told me, he's like, yeah, I was like trying to get Molly. He's like, well, I got this one plug, but I don't know, man. I, I pistol whipped him. And I remember thinking, I'm like, okay, hmm, pistol whipped the guy. And I ended up meeting the guy I was talking about. He's like, I don't really like Steve, Riggy's real name. He's like, he pistol whipped me one time and he broke like six of my teeth. I was like, what the fuck? He was serious about that? I thought he was full of shit. He had been in the scene for a long time around graffiti, you know, GHB scene, underground, grimy ass LA shit, right? He got sober. You know, his whole situation is he was dating this porn star, this chick named Alex. And I really liked Alex. I did not say I wanted to fuck her. No, never that. What I'm saying is that she was somebody that I thought was really cool. You know, she was someone that I think really cared about him too. She was someone I had a threesome with with my ex-wife. What? Anyway, she left him. And he, um, he went off the deep end and tried to kill himself. Now, I've been there. You know, I was just telling the story on the bonus due marriage where I was talking about when I was trying to kill myself. And he had his rock bottom and he went to rehab and he detoxed. He had nothing. He had, he had bottomed out. He found God. He found a, he has over two years sober now. And like, that's a miracle. That's the biggest miracle as when I have two years, when Paul had two years, he's, he's the real deal addict. And I rarely say that about people because I think that there's a distinction between real addiction and people that are problematic drug users or problematic drinkers. There's most normal people burn their hand on a stove and they're like, ow, I'm not doing that again. No way. A proverbial hand burning on the stove is getting a prison sentence. Most people get sentenced to five years in prison. They're like, whoa, that ruined my life. I'm not doing that again. You know, there's people that are able from their own willpower to not do something again because the consequences got too severe. Then there's people that literally have to do it one day at a time, every, like one second at a time. Like every time I feel like I'm going to use, I'm going to cut a fucking slice in my face. Old faces. Oh, okay, I don't know what I'm talking about. All right, anyway, he was a real deal drug addict. So he was one of those people just like Paul. Paul was instrumental when I first got clean. Steve was similar to that because he was one of the people that I looked at where I was like, all right, if he can do it, I can do it. And I was having a really bad, I was strung out. He loves me. Come over to my house. He'd see the condition I was in. He's just like, Jesus Christ, man. I got to get you into treatment. I got this nonprofit. It's called like Music Cares or something. It's for artists that are, um, you got to be have a publishing credit for music. You know, nowadays, a publishing credit for music is like getting on Spotify. Anybody can put their music on Spotify. Like pretty much anybody can have a credit like that. It changed. You know, back in the day, it was a lot harder to get credits. I didn't have a music credit. I was like, well, Steve, <laughs> I'm not a musician. I am an author. Is there like an author cares? He's like, no. But you do have an album that you're doing with Johnny Depp. Maybe that'll count. 
So we called them and talked to them and, and they said that that would count if it came out, but I had to finish the album. So now there was like added pressure to get drug stories for truckers done because that meant that I'd be able to get into rehab. And eventually I did. I go into rehab and this is pretty sure where I left off last time. I go to shit in the bathroom the toilet's clogged and I ended up shitting in the sink. Southsider was like, because this is a state run facility, right? I'm used to the high class plush rehabs. We've talked about that where it's like satin sheets. That, you know, there's like a signed seating for the table. Every time you go to a fucking dinner at one of these rehabs, it's like going to a banquet. That kind of shit. People are wearing bow ties. This was a state-run spot. It was like military-style barracks. They give you tin cans to shit and vomit in. When you get there, they say, all right, we're going to give you the choice between Suboxone or Methadone. Now, Methadone, I'd always, in my mind, I'm like, all right, because I've been on Methadone. You guys all know about when I came off of Methadone. I've always looked at Methadone as kind of like being able to get high for free. You know, because Methadone gets you loaded suboxone will too but not like methadone so i all the people at this rehab are telling me they're like look man choose the suboxone they give you like five milligrams of methadone it does nothing it's like taking a 800 milligram ibuprofen the strong gun but you know i'm a stubborn junkie because they're if they give you a one milligram of buprenorphine suboxone or they give you five milligrams of methadone. Listen to me, neither one of those will do anything. But one milligram of buprenorphine is much, much, much better than five milligrams of methadone. So I decided to take the methadone. And once you take one, you can't do the other. So I was sick, you know, and there's like South Siders, like, hey, uh, hey, fool, hey, dog, um, can I be completely honest with you, kind of? Hey, you fucking smell like shit, dog. Can you go to the bathroom and wash your ass or something, fool? I don't want you sleeping in here. Your fucking, your fucking burp smell worse than my farts, dog. You're fucking disgusting, queer. Get out of here. You're fucking cum burps. It's probably because you swallowed so much fucking cum, you fucking faggot. So I ended up going to the bathroom. I go, I go to try to take a shit. It's clogged. So I had a shit in the sink. This, this pissed off the Southsiders, right? Became, this whole, like, you know, and I, like, try to, I, like, try to get away with it, too. I, like, ended up going back to my bed, like, acting like I didn't do it. And then I see, like, one of the, like, meanest-looking Southsiders get up and go to the bathroom, and I just, hey, what the fuck, fool? Hey, I think it was the Gavacho, hey. Hey, we should fuck that food up, dude. Hey, he fucking, he fucking shit in the sink. <sighs> Reminds me of my baby mama. You know, and I'm just like, ugh. So I ended up, that's what made me go out of these, like, barracks where you sleep. Because I was so sick, I didn't even want to get out of bed. But I ended up shitting in the sink. Created this whole commotion. I'm probably not relaying this part of the story correctly. But this isn't really the important part. That particular... Detox was co-ed. And the girls are just sitting out on the patio. I go out on the patio. This is that Tarzana Treatment Center. I go out on the patio. And there's a black chick. She looks super familiar. I'm looking and I'm sick, you know, but I mean, I'm not hallucinating. But I'm sick enough where I like don't really trust myself because I'm like, it can't be. But it was the girl that I had seen at Conrad's house that was topless. What are the chances? I'm in L.A. at this point. I mean, I guess, you know, when you're a drug addict, it kind of makes the world you're in a little smaller. And so I sit down, I had cigarettes, I light one up, and I start dogging over. I was like, hey, were you at Conrad's house? And she looks at me, and she's like, mouths it. I was like, what the fuck? I 
I was like, all right. Now there's this white dude that's there, comes out maybe like seconds after that. He looks like Yosemite Sam. He's like some Danny DeVito body type midget with a fucking handlebar mustache. I forget what his name is, but you know, let's call him. He's like, oh, I'm Hank. You know, this is my bitch, Cynthia, or whatever her name was. It was some white name, though, like that. <clears throat> so, like, she was with their boyfriend. So I, that's why I couldn't talk to her right there and then. But um, started talking to this other guy, you know, some other guy's telling me some story about how he was, like, driving across the country from Idaho, and he had been taking Suboxone for, like, four years. And he started going cross country and he said he just ran out of them in LA. So he checked himself in here. I was like, well, if you've been taking Suboxone for four years, didn't you like, I don't know, man, didn't you kind of know that you'd run out and that it was bad if you ran out of your medication? And he like, gra I swear, he grabs me by the shirt. He's like, listen, man, I'm about to fucking run from the law right now. Yeah, that's right. I'm not trying to talk about it. I was with these like weird hills have eyes, like you know, um, fucking freaks. All of these people seem like they were like radiation mutants or something. They were all weird, except the black chick. She was pretty. Finally, I get her alone. She's like, yeah, I was at Conrad's. She's like, I don't want to hear, I don't want Hank to hear. Do you know what happened to Conrad? I was like, no. You didn't hear what happened to him? I was like, no. I was, and I told her the story. I was like, well, you know, last time I was in Santa Barbara, I, I rolled up to the house and there was this yellow caution tape around the house when I tried to go score from him. I was like, I saw you there last time and you had your shirt off. She's like, mm-hmm. You didn't know that he's in jail? I was like, jail? For what? For murdering Danny. I was like, what? She's like, he didn't do it. I was like, what do you mean? Well, this is what happened. And so she starts telling me the story. Now, remember, she can't really tell me this because her boy, she can't tell me this in front of her boyfriend. But she's telling me that my friend Connor had been arrested for murder. And we start talking about it. She's talking like really fast and explaining it to me. So what had happened is that girl, Danny... Um, he got back with her. So he had dated her. I went to high school with her. She was a goody goody when I went to high school. He got, when, when she got out of high school, she started dating this guy at some point, you know, after our, you know, we had not been in each other's lives for a long time. He got her on heroin or he got her on Oxycontin back then and eventually got her on heroin. She left him for years and years and years. He like stalked her. Like he used to actively stalk her when me and him were friends. And when he f finally found her again, he became a heroin dealer and got her strung out on heroin so he could control her. So she had her own place. And they were like staying there, I guess. And he was selling dope out of the house and he was friends with this girl's boyfriend. Now, this girl's boyfriend was a pimp. Doesn't surprise me. It was like this short, Yosemite Sam-looking dude. White dude. Redneck. But this was his girlfriend, right? It seemed like a racist guy. This is like the impression that I got. I, I mean, I only saw him for a second, but he just had those shifty racist eyes. And I can't stand people like that. I hate racist people. I may joke about shit like that a lot, but like deep down, I really don't like people like that. And they were all... So basically, he was using her house as a point for back page dates. This black chick was just one of the people that, one of the girls that was turning tricks there. And her boyfriend, I guess, was paying him some sort of rent. And they were using her house, Danny's house, the girl I went to high school with. And my friend Connor was selling drugs out of it. Anyway, she overdosed. My friend Danny overdosed. I, n I didn't hear any of this. I wasn't living in Santa Barbara at the time, and I was strung out on drugs, so I was like in my own little world. She died of a drug overdose. This girl, Cynthia, I'm not sure if that was her name. It sounds right. It was something like that. 
Let's just call her that for the sake of the story, though. And Hank, I don't know if that's his name either. Conrad and Danny, though. So what had happened is her parents had gotten her this place. They were staying out there. See, I thought that that house in Montecito was his. But this was actually her place that she, um, that her parents had gotten her. So what happened is she overdosed on heroin. Now, my friend is responsible for it. No doubt. He got her strung out on purpose so that he could control her. He's a piece of shit like that. I mean, I don't even want to say this guy's my friend, but she ended up overdosing. They tried to bring her out of it with home remedies. They didn't call 911. She died. Now, this happened to me when I was in Florida. So, like, I am sympathetic to this fact. And as she's telling me this story, her boyfriend comes back. He's like, hey, you talking to my synth boo I was like, nah, man. Just smoking my cigarettes. Now, I became known as the shitster. You know, because I had shit in the sink. So all these cells, hey, look at the fucking shitster. Look at shitster. Hey, Uncle Shitster. Hey, yeah, you're fucking foul, my boy. You're fucking disgusting, queer. Everybody started making fun of me, so I don't want to be there, but I'm, like, super intrigued. I'm like, what the fuck? Like, I just found out my friend died of an overdose. I just found out that basically my friend had been arrested, but I still didn't know the details about, like, how he got busted for that or whatever. And it was hard to talk to this girl, Cynthia, because her boyfriend, the Yosemite Sam-looking pimp, was, like, really possessive and really controlling of her, and he didn't like her talking to people. It was actually, like, I think couple days until I got to talk to her again and hey it's fucking shitster the shitster meister you know and I'm just like god damn man and I hate being at places where you get a where you get a handle like that you know where people are making fun of you and calling you names it, it sucks I really get a kick out of the fact that everybody's calling me poo poo daddy like <laughs> on social media it's just funny because Kate actually called me that it's just so funny that there's so many people that call me that now I really like it when you guys call me that by the way it's probably my favorite name. Shaky Jake, but Poo Poo Daddy, that's a good one. Um, So I finally get to talk to her again. And so she tells me that this is how he got charged. So she dies. This is what she told me, anyway. She died at her place. They tried to call 911. Well, at this particular house, my friend Conrad had wait there. They're pimping girls out of it. Not underage girls, but it was just this 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 black chick, um, Cynthia, and I guess, um, Danny was turning tricks there too. You know, basically Conrad and this other guy were doing that out of that house. It was just all around a bad place. Well, after they tried to bring her out of it and she died, they just left. They took all the drugs and shit and they just got out of there. They didn't call 911 or anything. Her parents end up finding her dead at this house. That night that I... When, the night that I o overdosed on Christmas, or maybe it was the day after, when I had gone to Conrad's house, whatever night it was that I OD'd, I'm pretty sure it was either Christmas Eve, Christmas, right around then. I did a live that night. So if you go back and look, you can figure out the day that I this actually happened. When I had gone to his house, they had put yellow tape around the house, and uh, I didn't know what had happened. I thought something bad looked like a crime scene. And obviously they looked at it as foul play. You know, it wasn't just like considered an overdose. I guess her parents had found her. They're dead. So I'm still like, and I'm like, well, how did Conrad, like, how did he get implicated in it? And what happened is they did a forensic autopsy on her. They found that she had been drugged. And they found his sperm inside of her and somebody else's sperm on her hair. Two different sperms. Two sperms. I shouldn't say it. I shouldn't make a joke about that. I was actually, she was a good friend of mine in high school. It's actually like really sad. Definitely shouldn't be joking about it, but um, yeah, she died. Two sperms. Well, no, I'm all right. I, geez, that's, that's low ball. I'm sorry, guys. Um, and so my friend Conrad 
and another dude got arrested for it. Now, her parents suspected that it was him. And he probably flipped on the other guy. Imagine finding your daughter dead. I guess she was found without her shirt on. Topless, dead. Two different sperms. One on her hair and one inside of her from two different people. It looks foul. So he got questioned for it, I guess. I mean, she's telling me about this. Now, what's interesting about it is I'm from Santa Barbara, but I never heard about this. It was super hush-hush. And I guess he had gotten interviewed. This is what she was telling me. He got interviewed. His story wasn't adding up. Uh, he never left the interview. They arrested him for murder. And they were, they had enough to charge him. I don't know. You know, they had DNA and shit. I, and I'm like, but... But he didn't kill her. She OD'd. He's being charged with murder and rape. I'm like, rape? I was like, you know, and... It kind of put me in an interesting position at this point because I do definitely don't condone this kind of behavior. He intentionally got her strung out on heroin. He did that so he could control her because he was so obsessed in love, perverted, lustful towards her that he wanted to control her with heroin. That's just as bad as Jeffrey Dahmer drilling a fucking hole in somebody's skull to turn him into a sex zombie. Okay, maybe it's not that bad, but it's pretty close. Like, this guy was not innocent by any means. But he's being held for murder. And he'd always been really good to me. And I know he didn't rape her. I know that for sure. You know, I mean... I'd been over there and I don't know, maybe she wasn't coherent enough to know what was going on, but it's her ex-boyfriend. I don't think he raped her and I don't think he intentionally killed her. So I asked this girl, I was like, have you talked to the cops? No. Would you talk to the cops? Oh, hell no. She's like, my boyfriend would kick my ass. All right. So it's really bugging me now, you know, I mean, thinking about my friend, I don't want to see my, my boy get life in prison for something like that and get known as a sex offender. The guy has three kids, you know, he is a dirtbag and he did do piece of shit shit, but you know, he didn't deserve what was happening to him. So I had to like really kind of decide what I was going to do with that. I've never been the kind of guy that will fuck with law enforcement, talk to him. The only time I've ever talked to law enforcement, like to try to get anybody in trouble was over Mike Virgin, you know, pedophiles and shit. I don't look at that as ratting or anything. I look at that as being 20 years old and be like, hey, the fucking cop that arrested me is a child molester. I don't think that's being a snitch. I think that's, you know, I think pedophiles need to be off the street, personally. I think you could tell in any chomo, and I think that you get your, you're not considered a rat card on that one. So I'm like the laughing stock of this particular deep at Tarzana Treatment Center. And um, I end up meeting this guy. Now, this guy is Eddie Nash's son. If you've seen the movie Wonderland with Val Kilmer about the porn star and the murders that happened up in the hills in Hollywood... You know who Ed, Ed Nash is. He was like this Armenian fucking gangster in L.A. Famous guy. Met his son in rehab. Nice ass dude. The guy had a lot of money. Tons of drugs. He, he smuggled a bunch of shit in with him. He's like, hey, do you want a line of cocaine? Come here, man. I was like, a line of cocaine? I was like, we're in rehab. He's like, I ah, don't give a fuck, man. I'm doing it because my fucking wife, the fat, stupid bitch, man. She makes me come to rehab. But I bring cocaine every fucking time. I bring it up my ass. I don't give a fuck. I've been here a hundred times. They know that I do cocaine. I give them fucking hundred dollar bills. I don't care. Talk just like that. So I'm like, I swear, I'm like snorting blow with him, whatever. He's like, can you get heroin? He's like, you know, I don't have heroin. You know, what my, my fucking, you know, my stupid fat wife. 
Oh, the, the, I just thought it, it wasn't my Hungarian wedding. Sorry, off target. The drug story cowboy is my, um, oh my God. Now I just forgot. Fuck. It just came to me too. Ah, uh, that pisses me off. I just thought of something that was hard. Okay. It doesn't matter. My Mongolian, my Mongolian wedding. You guys are like, who the fuck cares? It was important to me. He's like, so my stupid, the, 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 the stupid fat wife, she fucking calls my heroin dealers and she tells them, she tells them that if they continue to sell me heroin, she cuts their fucking cock and balls off. What are they going to do? Nobody gives me heroin. He's like, if you can give me heroin, I'll give you $2,000. You know, I was like, holy shit. This guy was going to pay me just to hook him up with dope. I could get dope really easily in L.A. So we decide to break out of this rehab. He's like, let's go tomorrow. He's like, tomorrow we go. My stupid fat bitch wife, she won't be home. We can go over there. I'll get us some hookers. You know what I mean? I will fuck the hookers. I don't care. I don't care. I hate my stupid fat bitch wife. I'm only with her because her family's got money. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I know you know what I'm talking about. You know you're a good looking kid. If I had to guess, I'd say there's a little sugar in your tank, but you're decent looking enough where you could come over to my house. So I decided to go with this guy. But before I do that, I'm like, I'm like, damn. I kind of have a moral obligation here. First of all, I was friends with this girl, Danny. She's dead. That sucks. I don't want my friend to go down for rape and murder. There's no way that I can let that happen. But I don't want to go to the police either. I guess the only way to do it, and it wouldn't matter. I wasn't there, but this chick was a witness to it. And he didn't kill her, and he didn't rape her. So I wanted to make shit right. And we will get into what happens with that in the next installment of The Naked Girl. I love you guys. Thank you for a good month of January. I'm going to try to upload this right now so that it gets up before midnight. Palabra.